Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our sixth Marketing Club webinar of the series, The Values Economy, How to Deliver Purpose-Driven Service for Sustained Performance, with our guest speaker tonight, Alan Williams. The Marketing Club was created primarily to help students get the most from their CIM accredited degree and to prepare them for a career in marketing. Although the Marketing Club is designed for students, CIM members and other marketing practitioners are also welcome to attend these sessions. This webinar is one of a series of online events we've been running this academic year for our marketing club, with the final two webinars coming up in April. For the uninitiated, the CIM accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions the accredited degree provides. If you're a student, you can sign up now to receive the marketing club newsletter. Simply take a photo of the QR code you see on screen. Each edition will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. So I'd now like to hand over to Alan Williams of Service Brand Global, who is our guest speaker today. Thanks very much, Phil, and uh, good evening, everybody, or if you're in different parts of the world, good morning or good afternoon. And I'm really pleased to be joining you to be talking about the values economy and how to deliver purpose-driven service for sustained performance. I don't expect you necessarily to agree with everything that I say, but what I would like you to do is consider what I'm saying and maybe think about whether you agree or disagree or whether it prompts you to be curious about something that you want to look up after the event. So over the next uh, 45 minutes or hour, including the Q&A, uh, we're going to really have three sprints. We're gonna have a sprint on the concept of values. We're then gonna move through the context in which values exist and the changing landscape that we're experiencing. And then we're going to talk about the importance of alignment in sprint three and what you can actually do to equip an organization to thrive in this landscape. Now, for those of you that are in marketing roles already, the bottom right, you can see there the contemplative character and another go. And the reason for this is that at the end of the day, if nothing happens as a result of this talk, why have we all been here together? So if you're in a role thinking, what is it that you're gonna do? Even if they're small things, what is it that you're gonna do differently as a result of what we've heard? And if you're studying similar, but perhaps related to your studies, what is it that's piqued your curiosity? What is it that you want to learn more about? Now, I mentioned these three sprints, so as a bit of a warm up, um, really these four quotes summarize everything that I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes. And there's a bit of a breakfast thing going on there, which I think is going to make me hungry at this time of the day, uh, but never mind. The first one is often incorrectly attributed to Peter Drucker. So, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And again, I'm not sure how much uh, business experience many of you will have, but in my 30 years in business, I've seen loads of brilliant strategies in documentation that actually fail to materialize. And that's because the culture has not been grown or flourished to enable the application of that strategy and allow it to be realized. So culture really is by far the most important element of the two. Then a quote by Terry Deal and Alan Kennedy, culture is the way we do things around here. I love that, Sim the simplicity of the quote. Uh, it really is just in an organization, what happens around here? That is the culture. It's not what is written on the wall. It's not what people say happens. It's what does happen around here. And then the final two quotes are, are mine, actually. Uh, so the first one, values are for living, not laminating. 
and you can see a picture of a mug there. You know, you'll be familiar with organizations with the values all up on the wall, sometimes etched into the stone of the wall. That's impressive, isn't it? Um, but actually, what's most important is the values are brought to life. And then finally, uh, really playing on the, the first uh, quote, culture eat strategy for breakfast. Uh, I only, only thought of that, this one, uh, when was it? December, I think it was last year. And that is content without context is toast. And what I mean by this is that how often do we go to conferences or talks like this where content is delivered? That's what I'm delivering today. But what you cannot do is take that content and just drop it in to another context. So let's say there are two of you out there working for different organizations with very different styles, personalities, values. What you need to be able to do is apply the content in today's talk and adapt it to fit for your particular context. And if you don't do that, it, the likelihood is that it will not work. So those four quotes are kind of like a, an intro to the session and kind of summarize everything that I'm going to touch on in a bit more detail. So let's go uh, to the first sprint. So this is the concept of values. And uh, our first co-authored book was published in 2013. And my goodness, that's eight years, which seems an age especially with COVID in between. I think, you know, everything pre-COVID seems like a, another lifetime, actually. Uh, and values has become a real hot topic in that uh, eight years. And you, you barely hear a news announcement or read something in the press today without the values word being mentioned. But what is it? You know, what, what are our values? And I'm just going to pause there for a second because we use the word very freely nowadays, but are we really considering what it means? So just just take 15 or 20 seconds to ask that question to yourself and consider what are values to you. So I'm hoping that um, some of you will be along the lines of, well, values are what's really important deep down. Values are what you won't give up for anything. They are deeply, deeply important. But actually, the definition that I really like is this one. Values are emotionally laden motivators. They are a behavioral and decision-making compass. Now, some academics, um, make the whole examination of values a whole lot more complicated than this, talking about different levels, different types, and that's all fine. Um, but I like to keep this topic very simple and think of values as these emotionally laden motivators. So these values are the things that guide us towards the choices and decisions and behaviors that we make when we choose to use them in a conscious way. And I find that by keeping it in that simple way, it helps me certainly be able to use values at a very conscious level without getting confused by the complexity that some people attach to the topic. And just because I'm saying that values are important, well, you know, so what? Who am I? But actually, other people say that values are important too. Simon Sinek is somebody that you might well have come across because he's very well known and very well regarded, quite rightly so. And he talks about the golden circle of the what, the how, and the why. And you can see on the slide here that there are definitions of each of those three. The point though is that Simon talks about how in business, we spend kind of 80% of our time focused on the what. But actually, what engages people at an emotional level, hearts and minds, is the why and the how. So the purpose, the why, 
and the values, the how. And yet in business, we don't talk about that very much at all. We're focused on the what. Now, he uses an Apple example, uh, Apple the company, to demonstrate this. And whilst I think Apple might be overused in this sort of um, business presentation, I do think that this is a very, very good example. And what he says is that, you know, Apple say the reason why we are here is to make the world a better place. And how we're going to do that is by making really user friendly technology. And what that looks like is an iPhone, an iPod, an iPad, and the rest. He then says, compare that with Dell. Sorry, anybody from Dell, it may be things have changed since this, uh, this was quoted. Um, but compare that with Dell, he says, who say, do you want to buy a laptop? Which is totally uncompelling. So the why and the how is what engages people and what we should be spending more of our time on when we're talking to people in our business instead of all of the focus and energy and time on the what. These studies also quote values as being critical. So IBM surveying 1700 chief executive officers and them quoting imperatives of empowering employees through values and the importance of shared beliefs to guide decision making and the processes and tools around that. Then the next one in the middle, we've got a PWC similar survey, 1400 chief executive officers, 93% of them agreeing that it's important to have a strong corporate purpose that is reflected in their organization's values, culture and behavior. And then the Financial Reporting Council have reviewed their corporate governance code to include a responsibility for boards to create a culture based on their values and to report on their progress against that over the long term. Now, if that's implemented with teeth, that could be a real game changer. Now, let's just consider the evolution of the customer relationship. And we, we're going to use coffee as an example here. So way back when coffee beans were just a commodity they were traded as such and then the next stage of evolution was that you could go into a shop and you could buy a bag of coffee beans which you would take home to brew your coffee and then the next stage of evolution was that a service was offered so this is when instead of going into the shop to buy your bag of coffee beans you could actually go into the shop and buy a cup of brewed coffee. It became a service. And then this graph is based on the work of Pine and Gilmore, who created the concept of the experience economy. And Starbucks is a great example where, you know, they say, what's your name? And then when your coffee is ready, they shout your name and you walk down the street with your branded cup in your hand showing the world that you're a Starbucks customer. Nowadays, the customer experience is still promoted by many consultants and many people in business as being the real forefront of progressive business. But if we think about this, I mentioned just now that the experience economy was created by Pine and Gilmore, but in the 1990s, now, that's more than 20 years ago. That's actually in the last century. So the question is, have things not changed over that period of time? And I suggest that it has. I suggest that we have moved on from an experience being what we're looking for and what impresses us to a situation 
where what we're looking for is a sense of shared values. Now, imagine that you are visiting a theme park and it's fantastic. They've got a brilliant reputation for customer experience. The rides are all fantastic. The food and beverage is brilliant. Uh, they just deliver a wonderful experience. But then you find out that they're using uh, slave labor, perhaps in parts of the world, or they're underpaying employees. Perhaps for some people, that will be enough for them to no longer even consider doing business or being a customer of that organization. An example of Tesla, the highlighted words here, companies' customers would volunteer to help distribute its vehicles contributing to a project that they consider themselves to be part of. The second highlight, people want to be part of a project that is not about selling cars, but changing the world. So what Elon Musk realized was that his customers were not just customers, they were part of a movement, and that is a totally different ballgame. The values economy had already arrived, but COVID-19 has been a real turbo boost. And I'll just give you an example. I was doing a workshop uh, not very long ago and um, talking about this, this concept. And uh, I asked uh, if the audience could relate to this. And one lady in the audience from Scotland explained that she had uh, been to a wonderful restaurant. In fact, it was uh, a business with a chain of restaurants. And the, the particular one that she uh, liked best was a Michelin star restaurant. And every time there was, she had a celebration uh, or a special treat or some extra money where they could afford to go out somewhere like that, that's where they would go. Food was faultless, so was the service. Then she heard a story about how allegedly the company had been treating their employees not very well. No need to go into the detail. And it transpired that the human resources director in the company was actually the spouse of the owner. So it wasn't even a case of, well, we were unlucky with a human resources director, so we've made a change. And what she explained was that finding that out made her did make the decision to never visit that restaurant again, to actually tell people that they should not go there rather than recommend it. And this is significant because when we think about the importance that we attach to values, in the example that I've just given you that she related, values were more important to her than the experience, which she could not fault. So you can see how significant this stuff is. We'll now move on to the changing landscape. And just to put this in context itself, we are experiencing a rate of change that is faster than it has ever been before. And so who knows where this is going to go in the next one to five to 10 years. But for now, I just want to concentrate on three particular drivers which mean that values are more important now than they have ever been before. And the chances are that they will be more important yet again as we go forward. These three drivers we refer to as C to the power of three. And it's a perfect storm of choice, communication, and control. And I'll deal with each of these in turn. So first, some statistics. The reason I like to use these is because the whole area of values is sometimes criticized as being kind of warm and fluffy. It's not. And I hope that these statistics demonstrate this clearly. So 82% of people will pay more for a brand that shares their values. 
74% of people say that brands should try and make the world a better place. And 52% of people have bought a brand for the first time because of that brand's values. So we're making decisions on this much more emotional values-based level than we did before, when perhaps we were just encouraged to consider what's the best value for money? What am I getting for my money? There's a prediction here from Forrester that 50% of customers will buy from brands whose values match their own this year. And that's an increase of 15% on last year. And to re-emphasize this point about the rational versus emotional considerations, you can see the shift in the 20 odd years since 1997 where people are making the decisions much, much more on an emotional basis than they are on a rational basis. Now, we can translate this into some quotes from Howard Schultz, again, continuing this coffee theme, but I, I love these because they're so simple and when you hear them or when I read them, it's obvious. Authentic brands don't emerge from marketing cubicles or advertising agencies. They emanate from everything the company does. And mass advertising can help build brands, but authenticity is what makes them last. If people believe they share values with the company, they will stay loyal to the brand. And the reason this is so important is the bottom quote here which is that it takes years and years to build trust. It takes very little time to break and it can take forever to repair. So sometimes you're not able to do that. And this is particularly important in an age where your nearest competitor is just one click away for your customer. You know, just think of that you're really, really reliant on the authenticity of your brand time over time over time, rather than one flash successful lucky advert. And I love this quote from Maya Angelou to sum up this whole thing. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you do, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So let's play a game. 2018, uh, these figures are from, and this brand started in 1994. Global sales in 2018 were approaching 10 billion pounds, and in the UK, sales were 1.6 billion. 6,000 product lines. So again, let, let me just give you a few seconds to consider what that brand might be. In live events, have all sorts of uh, suggestions from Amazon to retail, other retail or um, in the real world, brick and mortar retail based outlets, um, manufacturing companies, automotive company came up once. But actually, this brand is fair trade. And the reason that I think this is such a good example is because fair trade on the shelf goods, people are willing to pay a premium of sometimes up to around about 30%. And the reason why they're willing to pay that premium is because they believe in the way that that got onto the shelf. They believe in it. It's not about what am I getting for my money? That's the rational approach. It's the, I believe this is the right thing for me to do the emotional approach. So let's move on to communication. And you can look up uh, both of these YouTube clips if you search for United Airlines US Olympic team, that's the one on the left, and uh, United Breaks Guitars for the one on the right. So these are two YouTube clips from United Airlines. The first one, uh, you can imagine it, can't you? Uh, it's something like, 
we are United Airlines. We have flown the United States Olympic team to the Olympic Games for the last blah, blah, blah. They've spent their hard-earned marketing budget on that advert. On YouTube, the number of hits that that's received, uh, last time I looked, it was around about 16,500. So hard-earned marketing budget, 16,500 views to influence people. United Breaks Guitars is a clip by a musician called Dave Carroll, who was flying with United and they broke his guitar. He spent about a year trying to sort it out to no avail, and in frustration, he wrote a song called United Break Guitars, which you can guess had more than 16,000 views on YouTube. In fact, it's approaching 20 million views. Now, the reason this is important is because social media has just cranked up the volume of communication beyond belief. And the important distinction between these two is that whilst United Airlines controlled their marketing spend and that advert, they had zero control over the Dave Carroll YouTube clip. Now, to put this into perspective, uh, in the six months after the United Breaks Guitars video went live, the United Airlines share price fell by around about 10%. And there was lots of discussion at the time, you know, was this because of this video or was it because of other stuff? And in our book, in our first book, we kind of, I suppose we sat on the fence a little bit here, but what we said was, we don't think it helped their performance. So social media turns up the volume. And the reason that that video is such a good example is because we listen to not the organizations themselves and their official messaging, but we listen to what other people say. You know, just think about your, your own experience and TripAdvisor, for instance. You know, how many of us look at the, the hotel website or the restaurant website, or do we first go and see what other people say about it? And then the third C is control. It used to be in the past that a company would lock themselves away or hire some experts uh, to do the thinking for them and come up with the messages that they wanted to send out there. And then they would do that through various means like marketing, public relations, advertising and the like. And it's almost like they would close their eyes, cross their fingers and hope that enough people would believe their message. Well control is shifting and now what's happening is that companies need to realize that they actually co-own their brand with their stakeholders and in fact not just their customers employees service partners local communities are all stakeholders who co-own the brand you know imagine yourself you're out, uh, you meet somebody, you say to them, oh, what job do you do? Who do you work for? What's it like to work there? What do you think they do? Do you think that they go to their phone, go to their company website and give you the spiel that is there, the official message? Or do they tell you about their felt experience? And even if you were given the choice to look at the official website and then hear their view, who do you believe? It's their version, not the official one. So the successful brands of the future are gonna be those that are able to establish a sense of shared values and culture with all of the various stakeholders. Just one final point on the consistency piece here, because you know that no longer is it good enough to have a fancy face to your customers but treat your employees poorly or your service partners because because of the communication C, the truth gets out fast. Previously, it might never have got out at all. Now it's only a question of time. So shared values and culture with 
all of your stakeholder groups consistently. And this is so much more important where people are the organization. You know, it's, it's the person that answers the phone in the help center. It's the security guy at the car park barrier. It's the food server. It's the receptionist that checks you into the hotel. These are the people that form the customer's view of their organizations. And just a little bit of what's happening in the world around values at the moment. So 73% of companies have between three and seven corporate values. But look at the right hand chart. Integrity, collaboration, customer respect, the same old, same old values being trotted out by these organizations. And because of this, people kind of don't treat them seriously. You know, they become like wallpaper, they become invisible. And we'll come to how you can deal with this better as shortly. And this same piece of research actually discovered that there was no correlation between corporate official values and what was happening in those organizations. Now, you might say, well, that's terrible. What an indictment on industry. But actually, if you take a slightly more optimistic view, what a brilliant opportunity for you if you can get it right. And a very topical story, P&O Ferries, many of you will have seen what's happened here. And there is a real stakeholder backlash here. Not just the employees that have been terribly dealt with and affected, but they've got the unions to deal with as well. Customers I've heard saying, I'm never gonna use P&O Ferries again. Other customers are even confusing P&O Ferries with P&O Cruises and making that connection. So the, the ripple effect of this is actually more than you might imagine. Local communities like Dover having really understandably strong feelings about this. Service partners as well, because who wants to be dealing with a company that is seen to behave like that? And unusually, the government is even getting involved, which we don't often see, but perhaps that's another evolution of just how many different stakeholders get involved at this values level. So the third sprint to finish with is, well, what can we do about this? And the fundamental principle is about using alignment to create your plan to take action. The service brand approach I created when I created Service Brand Global. And when I was thinking about how I would present the offer to the market, I just thought back on all of the roles that I had had, mostly in the hospitality sector, and asked myself, what were the common themes? What were, what were the threads that meant that I had achieved the great results in each of those jobs that had been achieved? And when I boiled it down, it was very, very simple. And this is what the service brand approach is today. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see three circles and the bottom right is brand. So this is about having crystal clarity about the character, personality and identity of your brand. So this is not the logo, right? This is who you are as an organization. Then we move to the left. This is everything to do with the employee. How do you get engaged employees? All of your people processes. And the final one is the customer. So the customer experience. How is this delivered consistently, irrespective of time, geography, or channel? Now, in businesses, in, in, in organizations, not just businesses, uh, so you could take a public sector organization, for instance, the brand, the employee and the customer stuff is owned by different functions. Even in smaller companies, this can be the case. 
So brand is owned by marketing, employee is owned by HR or people and culture, increasingly termed as people and culture, and the customer is owned by the operations or service delivery teams. What can happen is that these three functions devise their own unilateral strategies, don't talk to each other, and then they're shocked that it doesn't work. So the service brand approach is very simple in that it says you really need to align the development of your strategic thinking across these three areas, and you then need to coordinate the execution of it. And what that will do is generate additional value. You'll have a differentiated brand, you'll have engaged employees, and you'll have advocate customers. Now, I'm still an operator at heart, and so I'd just like to give you a practical example to demonstrate this approach. I work for an investment bank, and their marketing people, so looking after the brand, had come up with the strap line of the company name, People Are Fitter. So uh, at a tube station in London, they had these massive banners all over the inside of the tube station with XYZ company, People Are Fitter. At the same time, many of you will be familiar with the Ride a Bike to Work scheme. So basically, it's giving your employees a tax break if they want to buy a bicycle. Human Resources had communicated this to the workforce, but they had not referenced the company name, People Are Fitter. Missed opportunity. Then, in their offices, the people that deliver the employee experience is a function called facilities management or corporate real estate services. So human resources have not spoken to these people either. And as a result, guess what? There was no safe place to put your bike in the car park in the basement. How crazy is that? You've spent your hard earned money that you've been encouraged to spend by the company with a tax break deal, but there's nowhere safe to park it. Now move to the right hand side of this slide and imagine if the service brand approach had been taken, what would have happened? Well, human resources would have communicated the ride a bike to work scheme, referencing because our company people are fitter, and they would also have said, and we've got a, a bike racks, and maybe at the back of the bike rack, you've got the company name and our people are fitter at the back, and we've got shower facilities in the basement as well, so that you can freshen up on your way to work. You see the difference for very little additional investment, you create a whole lot of extra value. And I translate this into, and I'm just gonna use my cursor to identify brand, employee, and customer, which is supported by two other elements. One is systems and processes, and this is kind of the infrastructure of the business, everything that makes it go round. And everything goes in here from the organization structure to governance processes, to the communication framework, all of that stuff. But the reason it goes in this box is because its sole purpose should be to help brand, employee, and customer experience go round and be at their best. And then the final element is this one over here, measurement and insight. So getting data about performance and feedback from various stakeholders. This in effect is an operational excellence model. And you can see from this that what happens is that you're doing stuff tactically, receiving in the moment data about your performance and responding in a tactical way. At the same time, this data is captured to feed into a more strategic business planning process. So let me give you an example of a hotel company, and it might be that they've got hotels all the way around the country, and they're experiencing an issue with, let's say, the checkout stage of the customer experience. For the time being, they're allowing the individual business units, the hotels, to do their best to correct this. But they're discovering that this is actually not shifting in a positive way. And so they might choose to invest 
in a program that is across the company for a six month program, for instance, to deal with the specific issue of checkout across the whole portfolio. And by using this approach, you really generate these business outcomes where people are focused on service excellence, they're focused on always being better, being able to scale, and a culture that everybody can buy into. So as we approach uh, the conclusion of this, there are some key messages that I'd like you to consider as takeaways. The first is that there are many people out there that purport to have a silver bullet that's gonna be the savior. Uh, and it's not, it really isn't. There is no silver bullet, but I do believe that alignment is critical and the key, but it's more like a spider's web. So loads of activity happening, which is crisscrossed to give you that strength. Remember that employees are the organization. And if you remember that the people in front of your customers have a disproportionately important impact on your customer's perception of your organization. You know, I used to be a managing director of a five-star hotel, but I understood that it was the person on the golf course, the person in the spa, the person at reception, the waiter in the restaurant. Those were the people that had the biggest impact. You need to know where your north is, your culture and your values, and to take action, to praise it when it's in place, and to correct it when people stray from it. This values-driven approach is really your best chance of creating loyalty, not only for your clients, customers, but also your employees. The quote from the beginning about values needing to be lived, not laminated. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that once you've done the roadshow, and uh, you've shared with everybody what your values are, that's it, job done. No, it's not. Day after day, every single person, that's the way to do it. And for those of you that are marketing professionals, uh, you might not agree with this, but I do think that clients, customers, and other stakeholders are the new marketing department in some way. So this is the values economy in reality, it's here. But also remember this, that for you to be successful over time, it is hard work. It really is hard work. So be prepared for that. Also remember, you know, I have some, I have people saying to me, oh, Alan, we're not gonna look at our values and culture just yet because we're so busy with some other stuff. As though nothing's gonna happen in the interim. Well, you need to face the reality. If, the, you, if you do not intentionally shape your values and culture, something will develop anyway, and it might not be what you wanted. Leaders have a lot of responsibility and privilege actually here because they need to lead in practice and show by example. Remember also that practice makes more perfect. We'll never reach perfection, but practice, practice, practice does help. And it's the real world. So Sometimes it happens, sometimes it happens like we weren't expecting or we didn't want, but when that does happen, just get over it and move on is what I would advise. So remember finally that the way people behave can reinforce the organization's values or not. There's kind of no in between. So we've been through our three sprints, thank you very much, dealing with the concept of values, the context of our changing landscape, and how alignment can help action be most effective. But for now, over to you for questions, observations, reflections, and comments. Okay, Alan, thank you very much. That was, um, that was brilliant, some uh, very sort of thought-provoking ideas there. Um, we're going to head into our Q&A session and we've got one or two uh, questions already, um, which we'll get to in a second, but please do continue to post your questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Just a couple of quick stories for me actually, uh, Alan. Um, one concerning P&O ferries, I, I'm actually a, an advocate of P&O cruises, I've been on several cruises myself and uh, 
within a day had a, an email from P&O Cruises distancing themselves from P&O yeah. Ferries just to let let me know that they had nothing to do with P&O Ferries. I knew that already. Um, the second little story is around Starbucks because in my hometown, um, they recently opened up a, a brand new Starbucks outlet dead opposite a Cafe Nero, which is our favorite our favorite um, coffee shop. But we thought we'd try out Starbucks and we went in there. I think it was the first day that actually opened. Um, the service was lousy. The coffee that they made was absolutely disgusting. Um, and, I, and I was charged an extra 20 pence for the privilege of getting a disgusting coffee. Um, so I won't go back there again. So I guess I didn't have no idea what Starbucks values actually are, but my own personal experience of Starbucks on that one occasion has put me off going there for the for the for the, for the duration. So I'll go back to Cafe Nero. So anyway, that's my that's my two little stories to uh to well, end I bet the session. Cafe Nero would be delighted to hear those stories. Yeah, and I hope they give me a free one for, for that. <laughs> okay, so our first question then is um how can you sort of square off the sort of drive towards economic growth and with uh, also on the flip side to that you know our, our need to to behave in a sustainable way or for business to behave sustainably um how, how do those two sort of competing values fit together i don't think they do and so for me it's about being uh, true to who you are rather than being seen as wanting to make a quick buck and those organizations that are authentic will be around much longer than those who will be found out. Okay, um, so our answer. Um, do you think the mindset of values over experience best represents the younger generation rather than those in Gen X and older, perhaps? Yeah, that for, so from the research that I've read, there is an indication that younger people are leading the way on this. But actually, and maybe surprisingly, there wasn't as much of a differentiator or delta as I was expecting, for sure. And even older generations, myself and even older than that, are also making decisions uh, based on values rather than uh, a more rational or even financial consideration. Now, what I would say is that it'll be interesting to see you know, what's going to happen with what's happening with the economy at the moment, where people are finding it tougher. So I think there will be a challenge for some people because I'm not looking at this through rose-tinted glasses and saying that you know everybody is going to always be making a values-based decision. And perhaps some people will be in a position where they're saying, well, actually, I do normally buy fair trade goods, but I'm having to make choices and maybe I'm going to stop doing that because I can't afford it. Um, so I think that the whole thing around values is that some people do paint it to be this panacea of light and loveliness. And actually, I take a, a very different view that it's a very, very practical, nitty gritty way to help you make difficult choices and decisions. I was on a webinar um, a while ago now, but uh, somebody said to me, uh, do values uh, compete? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. And found myself making up this hypothetical story of a guy whose two core values was family and uh, peace. This guy was out of work and had a partner and a young child to feed. He was offered a job in an ammunition factory. So what does he do? He might consider it and decide that he's going to take the job in order to feed his family. But for every minute he's not working, he's going to be looking for another job because he hates working there and doesn't want to work there for any longer than he has to. But that's the reality of it, right, where values can help you make a choice and for you to feel comfortable with the choice that you've arrived at okay um i mean there are a couple of questions around the cost of living crisis which you just sort of uh, referenced um i guess this is a, a follow-up so uh, the question is how does rational and emotional purchases play out with people on the lower end of the socio-economic ladder um, can they afford to be concerned about values in the same way 
Yeah, and I, 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 that's that's exactly the point that I was just making, where pe people will have to make their choices. And sometimes if you haven't got the money to be able to buy that fair trade product, then maybe you won't. Um, but there are other alternatives as well. I just discovered Olio over the weekend. So this is an app um, which is all about eliminating food waste. So if you've got food that is coming up to its sell by date or you don't, you're not going to use anymore, you can put it on this app and people can come and collect it. I, I just tried it over the weekend and the stuff that I put on there was claimed within an hour. And so there are creative ways that things can be dealt with as well. Um, but I, I think that the real answer to this question is not about black and white. It's more about people using their values to make choices that are right for them in a situation. Um, I think this is a, a related question. So you put up some statistics earlier about the fact that 50 percent of people are more likely to buy brands whose values match their own. So that was the, the overall percentage. But um, does, was there any sort of uh, demographic biases in that particular piece of research? Um, yeah, so you, Forrester are brilliant. So if you just, um, if you go, well, you can use the link that was on this presentation or you can uh, Google Forrester values research. They've been working in this space for around about seven years now and they do break it down into various sections by age, by socioeconomic grouping and others. So you can get a very clear understanding of where the differences are. But I think what still stands true is that those differences are less pronounced than we might imagine. And actually there's a guy, um, a guy called David Allison, I've got his book in a pile here, and he, what he's advocating is that those, the, the ways in which we've segmented markets in the past might not be as useful as we thought they were. And he advocates a values-based segmentation, which I find really fascinating. Okay, that's, that's just, um, really good to know. What was the, what was the name of that book and author again? Uh, so... Here we are. We are all the same now. Value Graphics by David Allison. Right. Maybe he'll buy it. If I drank coffee, maybe he'd buy me one because of it. <laughs> yeah, but not in Starbucks, probably. No. Um, <laughs> why did you use the analogy of sprinting in, in, this, uh, in this presentation? Why, why is everything a sprint? <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice question. So the, the reason I use that is because I sometimes find presentations like this pretty dull and boring and people are kind of psyched up. Oh, my God, I'm going to be sitting here listening to this stuff for 45 minutes, nearly an hour. So the reason I use this was to get a bit of energy into people and for them to be thinking, oh, OK, I'm going to be doing a sprint and then another one and then another one, which feels for me uh, a bit more acceptable than a 45 minute trudge okay so so it wasn't a reference to the fact that um you know you need to be quick about this you need to make sure that you get your your, your values in a row you know don't don't dilly dally over it um but i guess with no, something like this you really need to take your time so no it, it wasn't that but and and actually i would say the reverse i would say take your time about understanding your values and be certain that they're the right ones and live with them as you go rather than be in a hurry treat it as a learning journey okay um just uh, one final question before we uh we have to um wrap up this evening so obviously we've got a, a quite a, a a large number of students on the event uh, this evening um looking perhaps for their first job out in the big bad world um how can you gauge whether a company that you might be interested in working for actually shares your own values or that there's going to be a good match between the two? How should you go about that? Yeah, well, you can do your research, um, but I, I would suggest that if you can connect with people in the organization and ask them rather than look at the official corporate stuff, and then if you're involved in any recruitment and selection process, how are you treated? 
uh, you know, it's a really good measure. I remember a job where I was kept waiting uh, at interview for an hour and I ignored the signal and I took the job and it was a mistake. Uh, so listen to the experience, how you're treated by everybody in the organization. Uh, that's a really good indicator. Brilliant. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Um, OK, uh, we have some good questions there and it's a shame we've run out of time to get through more um but thank you very much for answering the ones that you did some really great advice and hopefully some useful tips that our viewers can take away with them this evening um sadly that's all the time we have for our webinar uh, tonight i'd like to say thanks to alan for his excellent presentation and we do hope that you have found it interesting and worthwhile um we'll be back with our next marketing club webinar boost your employability on wednesday the 6th of april and with a slight change of time for this one it's at one o'clock that's 1 p.m on behalf of CIM, that just leaves me to thank Alan once again for a fantastic presentation and to say a thank you to you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed the session and we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future. Take care, everybody.